Good evening, everyone. A warm welcome uh, from me, Dr. Raja Dhar. I'm a pulmonologist working in Kolkata, and I welcome you to this webinar, the CCI Thursday webinar, which this time is on goal 2023. I'm aware that you had a meeting on the World COPD Day as a part of the CCI Thursday webinars, where we spoke briefly about the gold guidance and COPD. However, we've had some more time since then to dissect and look at the gold guidance. And the plan today is to discuss the Indian perspective. So it's not a critique of the guidelines, but it is more to understand the guidance and see how it's applicable to an Indian population in various strata. So, you know, tertiary care, secondary care, primary care. We want to look at the guidance and tell you how it's applicable, when it's applicable, and how you would change your practice, if at all, depending on the guidance. So, how we do this is like we've always done the CCI webinars, which is to start off with a short presentation, which I will do, which will just tell you about what's changed in gold. When I share my presentation, which I'll do in a minute, you will see there's a lot that's changed, a huge number. And it wouldn't be possible in 15 minutes to cover everything, nor probably is it warranted. So what I'll do is to look at what is the highlights, in my view, about changes. And then we will discuss each of these points individually. And we will try and dissect these and tell you how they're relevant to an Indian population. So the goal 2023 update, I won't read through this list, but this is just to tell you that there's a lot of bullet points in the initial document itself, which outlines the key changes. And I have picked up some of them for all of you. So the first thing we start off with is the revised definition. I've put in a lot of text because I've actually cut pasted a lot of material from the gold guidelines itself. So apologize. I normally don't put in so many, so much text and I don't read through my slides, but I'll do that today because I've not really had a chance to look through them and have enough confidence to provide a gist. So I'll do a little bit of reading. So that definition is that it's a chronic lung condition characterized by chronic respiratory symptoms and the chronic respiratory symptoms we are talking about are dyspnea and sputum production. Uh, and then it goes on to say that it could be due to abnormalities of the airway, which is bronchitis or bronchiolitis, or the alveoli, which means that it's emphysema. That's the first definition. And what is to be remembered, and so you want, I want you to hold this thought because I'll come to this in questions and answers in the panel, is that we're talking about two phenotypes already, the two that we have known forever the pink puffer and blue bloater, as it was called 50 years ago, which is the chronic bronchitis and the emphysema phenotype. The next thing which is new is pre-COPD. And this is exciting. This is new stuff. And it talks about individuals who can have respiratory symptoms and or structural lung disease. And here we are talking about CT appearances of emphysema and then have abnormal lung function test like a low FEV1 or a low normal FEV1, gas trapping, hyperinflation, reduced lung diffusion factor, but an FEV1 FVC ratio, which is above 0.7%, sorry, above 70%, which means it's normal. And like before, we are talking about post bronchodilated FEV1. So think about individuals who have symptom burden, the cough and sputum, who have normal spirometry defined by a ratio of more than 70%, but also have other features like structural lung disease on a CT and other lung function tests being abnormal like GLCO. So that's about pre-COPD. The third thing that has come in the definition basket is PRISM. And this is an acronym which is attractive, it's catchy. And a lot of you would have heard this. PRISM is Preserved Ratio Impaired Spirometry. So preserved Ratio Impaired Spirometry, as the name suggests, has been proposed to identify those who have a normal ratio, but still have an abnormal spirometry. So normal ratio, but abnormal spirometry. So subjects with pre-COPD and PRISM are ones who we feel at least a large subpopulation would go on to develop the current spirometric def defined 
COPD going forward. So that's the significance of identifying this population. So that's about definitions. The second big bit, which is interesting, exciting, even though we don't really know how important it would be from a management perspective, if at all today, is to talk about proposed taxonomy, which Gold has defined as etiotypes. So etiotypes, etiological types are what we are talking about. And as the name implies, aside from smoking COPD, there are multiple other causes of COPD that have been identified over the years. And there's a lot of Indian work that's gone into this. And there are other etiotypes which will get defined going forward. So Gold has come up with acronyms. So genetically defined, de determined COPD, COPDG, lung abnormal defects, which they came up with in 2019. So small lungs at birth, hence causing COPD. They have refined that as COPDD, environmental COPD, cigarette smoking COPD, which is a C. I will not read through this entire list because it's not important. What's important is that these etiotypes have been defined to improve your consciousness, our consciousness, that aside from smoking, there are these different environmental factors which can add to the burden of COPD. So that's why etiotypes are exciting, as Dr. Chabra put it, and important from a clinical perspective. But like I said, probably not yet from a management perspective. So I'll look at these very, very briefly. The gene interaction mainly is about alpha-1 antitrypsin. And like asthma, Gold says that this is also a gene environment interaction. So you remember in asthma, it's a genotype. And along with that, you have an environmental trigger that makes the disease worse. So COPD now is thought to be similar. You have the genetic defect in a small proportion, much smaller than asthma, but in a small proportion. And then you have a larger proportion of people who have an environmental trigger, where cigarette smoking is only one of lots of triggers that are seen in individuals. The environmental triggers we have talked about already, there's tobacco smoke, there's air pollution, there's household smoke, there's the incense stick, which is spoken about and published in India. So there's various environmental triggers that you can think about. And in the appropriate context, a non-fully reversible airflow obstruction, you remember that's the same as what we defined COPD as before, measured by spirometry, confirms the diagnosis of COPD. So that's putting into perspective the environment and the gene in the etiotypes of COPD. The other causes are important. We have always felt that TB and post-TB lung disease is an important cause of obstructive pulmonary disease, which is mainly fixed airflow obstruction. So Gold now talks about infection, lung function decline with infection at a rapid rate. They've said that people who are living in overcrowded conditions, who have early life poor nutrition and are exposed maybe to the environmental triggers might go on to have recurrent lung infections causing a decline in lung function due to obstructive airways disease and this includes tb biomass i won't dwell on this but you know biomass exposure is a huge problem we feel that in asia and africa the burden of biomass is three times three times that of cigarette smoking. So it's a huge problem. Air pollution is a huge problem. And then you've got multimorbidity. So multimorbidity as in people with COPD being a systemic disease, have cardiac factors, cardiac comorbidities. They've got skeletal muscle wasting. They've got bone thinning in the way of osteoporosis. And all these factors, these multimorbids together result in wasting, weakness of respiratory muscles, and over a period of time, add to the burden of breathlessness, inanition that is classical in patients with COPD. So that's about environmental risk factors, infections, and multimorbidity. In the ambit of clinical presentations, what is new in that slide is the realization that along with tobacco smoking, you can have other environmental triggers we have spoken about which can cause cough and phlegm without causing an abnormal spirometry. And we have defined that in the pre-COPD and the PRISM category. All of you have seen these patients. Patients who come to us with cough, phlegm, you do a spirometry in these individuals and you find that the spirometry is normal by the criteria defined by gold till now. So that's the pre-COPD and PRISM criteria. There are ongoing studies which are being done one which has been published called the Rethink Study, 
which has looked at treating these individuals and to see whether it notes that it causes a difference either in prevention of progression of disease or in reducing the burden of symptoms. The jury is still out though. We won't discuss that today. That's for a later date. But treating these individuals might alter the natural course of the disease in pre-COPD and in the prison population. The chronic bronchitis population has been looked at separately and in greater detail in gold. They've said that the prevalence is a third of all COPD patients. So 27 to 35% is what they have said. Mostly in smokers, gastroesophageal reflux disease is thought to increase the incidence of chronic bronchitis. I found that interesting, actually. We know that there's a correlation between COPD and gastroesophageal reflux disease, as there is between ILD and gastroesophageal reflux disease. But this is the first time we've come up with some data, one study which comes out from Scandinavia, looking at gastroesophageal reflux and worsening chronic bronchitis without impacting the emphysema component to a significant extent. And that's something important to remember. And the fact that in chronic bronchitis, like we already know, stuff like mucus plugging, thickening of the peribronchial areas are changes which might help you to identify the chronic bronchitis population compared to the COPD population. I've got a lot of stuff there on imaging and CT scan, and we'll discuss about this. But suffice to say that as we are going forward, along with doing spirometry and lung function tests, CT scan appears to be a more important tool compared to what CT scan used to be a few years ago. So not for a moment am I implying that COPD, according to Gold, needs to have a CT scan done in every patient. However, the indications for doing a CT scan seem to be expanding as we are going forward. And this talks about linking COPD scanning with lung cancer screening in the US, where the new mandate is 50 years rather than the 60 years from the National Lung Cancer Screening Program. So the US now mandates 50 years as the cutoff for doing lung cancer screening. And they have said you rope in the COPD uh, screening along with lung cancer screening. The newer techniques like putting in coils, vapor ablation, in patients with predominant upper lobe emphysema also necessitates increased use of CT scanning, CT screening in that particular population of patients. M comorbidities like bronchiectasis, it's important to scan uh, these people. Exacerbating population of patients, you want to know whether these people have an overlap of COPD and bronchiectasis and you want to scan these people. So broad categories, this is straight from goal, broad categories, differential diagnosis, so bronchiectasis we spoke about, lung volume reduction surgery, coils, vapor ablation are, are things that we talked about briefly, and then tying it to lung and cancer screening are the three areas, one, two, three areas, which are important according to Gold. This is a lovely study. This came out in respirology, and I was lucky enough to be a reviewer for this paper. Gold has put this in, and I want you to look at this for a minute. You can see two different bars here, one in ash and one in gray. The one in ash looks at the prevalence of the comorbidity, which is being mentioned in the survivor population. So the gray is in the survivor population and the ash is in the non-survivor population. So you see these two bars, one above the other. The one which is above is in survivors. The one which is in ash is in non-survivors. So in most cases, you see that the comorbidity increases the burden of dying early, right? So the survivors are more, uh, are less as compared to the non-survivors. So patients with emphysema, patients with bronchiectasis, patients with interstitial abnormalities, along with having COPD, will die more, have a greater mortality. The same with coronary artery calcification, the same with people with um, aortic enlargement. The ones which don't seem to matter are hiatus hernia, steatosis, osteoporosis adds, reduces the chances of surviving long term. So this is a lovely slide. I haven't included it in the panel, but this is something we could discuss if the panelists found it interesting. So that's something which is new, a very recent study in respirology. This is one of the last things that I'll discuss, I'm in the last two or three minutes of this talk, and we'll discuss this threadbare. 
But the ABCD tool that we were familiar with since 2011, when Gold brought it in, has been replaced by ABE. So A and B as before are stable patients with COPD with varying degrees of symptom burden and E is the exacerbating population. The reason Gold says they have put in E is because when you put C and D as the exacerbating population, you were correlating the symptom burden with exacerbations. And Gold says in the exacerbating population, forget about symptoms. C is very little throughout the globe anyway and replace it just as an exacerbating population taking symptom burden out of the equation in this category. So that's their justification. We will discuss whether this is something which was worthwhile doing or not. Then they go on to talk about the inhalers, which are correct, about the fact that Laba Lama is still the most appropriate inhaler in the exacerbating population. However, in people with, who are exacerbating with a eosinophil count, which is above 300, you would want to put the ICSM. So that's their take. The fact that dual bronchodilatation in patients with a higher symptom burden to start off with is something new in, uh, in gold. And we'll come to these during the course of discussion. So I've spoken about this. Um, this is about therapeutic interventions. And it talks about things we have talked about already. So smoking cessation, rehab, long-term oxygen, NIV, lung volume reduction surgery were all there in previous gold guidance. This is something I have to mention. I won't discuss it during the panel because for us, this is not changed. But the vaccination guidance for stable COPD, according to Gold, has changed completely. So this is just for knowledge rather than practice because we don't have these vaccines today. Gold says that in stable COPD, you should start off by vaccinating with one dose of PCV20 if you have access to PCV20. And if you don't have access to PCV20, you do a PCV15 followed by a PCV23. So that's the guidance again. Our PCV15 and 20 valent vaccines will be available in the next two to three years. The PPSV23 is still available with us. And that's also going to have some more serotypes covered going forward. It's going to become the PPSV30. But it's watch this space for India now as opposed to formally adopting these guidelines today. A section on rehab, tele-rehabilitation has been added in, and I know people on this panel who are passionate about rehabilitation. So we'll come to them talking about rehabilitation going forward. And these are a long list of techniques, surgical techniques, interventional techniques, which I have put up and I will discuss briefly, but a lot of it is about hype rather than hope in my understanding. So I'll finish off there. Uh, and just a line about exacerbations, the definition of exacerbation has changed. And I'll also discuss this in the panel. The fact that exacerbation is defined as an event characterized by increased dyspnea and or cough or sputum that worsens in less than 14 days, accompanied by tachypnea and tachycardia with increased local and systemic inflammation caused by infection pollution or other insults to the airway. And then they have gone into diagnosis and assessment, looking at factors like symptoms, signs, markers like a CRP and arterial blood gas, and then trying to identify the trigger which caused the exacerbation in the first place. And we'll discuss all this. They have got four interesting comorbidities that they have added in new. I found them fascinating, so I've put them in the panel. We'll discuss that if we have time. It's frailty, polycythemia, anemia, and dental hygiene and periodontitis. So these are four factors and comorbidities which are recent, which are new and were not there in gold before. So I finished there. I hope I didn't overshoot time by a lot. And I hope I have given you a little bit of perspective about what gold has changed and how things have changed. So we'll start off with the panel. We've got an exciting panel. I won't go into details of introduction because these guys introduce themselves. Uh, they are thought leaders in the field. We have Professor Dr. S.K. Chabra. We have Dr. Rajesh Swarnakar. We have Dr. Murli Mohan. We have Dr. Sanjeev Nair. And last but not the least at all, we have our young Turk, Dr. Atri Gangopadhyay. And they cover the length and breadth of the country. 
I think we are a large country of 140 crores and it's nice that we have people on this panel, experts on this panel who covered the length and breadth of this country. So warm welcome to my dear friend, Dr. Agam. And the first question to Dr. Agam Vora. Agam, I wanted to start off by talking about the definition of COPD. The fact that in the last three years, it's not just been gold 2022, but in the last three years, we seem to have emphasized on chronic bronchitis and emphysema phenotypes separately. And I wonder, the fact that we've had this for about three years now, do you think it changes practice? Do you think it makes us more conscious? Do you think it's more about smoking and non-smoking COPD and the fact that these two are different diseases? <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Raja. As uh, expected, fantastic presentation, fantastic overview of uh, the newer guidelines. I didn't get enough chance to read about guidelines and I don't know how you prepared presentation and you delivered a talk. Um, one more reason, as I always say, jealous of you. And I must thank uh, CCI, my extended family, for giving me this opportunity to be here. And the discussion, yes. Uh, as a student, I was told about chronic bronchitis and emphysema, two different phenotypes, and one was purely clinical diagnosis, one was not at all clinical, which required probably radiology, or which required a lot of investigation. I don't know how you would diagnose COPD at that time when CT scans were not so easily available. But anyway, that was the two presentations. And then came a change uh, where it took me a lot of time to rectify those definition of COPD, where it is a common uh, preventable and treatable disease as we, as we spoke about. And with persistent airflow limitation, progressive, and those chronic inflammation and noxious gases, particle, etc. It, 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 it gave me some idea about this newer definition where things were uh, relatively easy because we realized that Though there are two different phenotypes, there was nothing much to offer. There was nothing much to do so that we probably kept them in one basket. And now COPD, newer definition says it's a heterogeneous lung condition with chronic respiratory symptoms. So it gives a little more importance to symptoms and tells it is due to abnormalities, which gives me idea that it could be a radiological abnormality. It need not have uh, the kind of uh, criteria which I had earlier thought of that. Uh, I need to have obstructive pattern and it tells me about pre-COPD and PRISM with uh, preserved uh, spirometry. I think it is interesting. I mean, yeah. though it's new, we are yet to understand the implications we would probably derive over some time. But it is really interesting to look at the definition which tells me that chronic symptoms of dyspnea, sputum production and cough with airway abnormalities could be COPD. It is often progressive. So it tells me that it need not always be progressive. And it tells me that, yes, there is a airflow obstruction. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. So, the, Agam, the other thing, I mean, I'll sort of suggest as an add-on, and I want a comment from you, is that, you know, with this thing about smoking and non-smoking COPD, this sort of emerging um, studies which seem to show, show that the smoking COPD phenotype affects more of emphysema. The non-smoking COPD, the biomass COPD, seems to be more of an airways disease, which is eosinophilic and hence more steroid responsive, probably yes. also explains to an extent why this division is important in today's day and age. Do you think? Yes, it would open up an entirely new set of uh, what is now described as etiotypes. And I would have been very happy if they would have added COPD T also tuberculosis or post tuberculosis, the way we see it in, in yeah. India. Yeah. And uh, yes, yeah. it is what you're saying is right. Yeah. So they have put in infections and we'll come to that. So TB mm -hmm. is in that gamut of infections, but that's absolutely correct. So thanks, Agam. I'll come to uh, Dr. Chabra. Dr. Chabra, sir, um, I have got a probably one of the more interesting questions in this panel for you. Um, it's about pre-COPD and about PRISM. And the fact that if you think back in 2004 uh, till about 2009, we had this category of gold zero COPD, which was probably equivalent to the pre-COPD that we are talking about today. And they have got PRISM, which is a new terminology. We have always known that some of these patients of COPD don't obey the FEV1 by FVC ratio of less than 0.7. So I've got two questions. One is, do you think doing this, putting this terminology is helpful for a clinician who is sat at the secondary care or the primary care level and manages to get a spirometry done? Symptoms of COPD, normal spirometry. And if yes, your thoughts about treating these patients I just mentioned one trial, which is the Rethink trial, which looked at a lava lama in treatment, which failed. 
and they suggested doing a laba ICS would be better. So uh, your thoughts about pre-COPD and about rethink, Professor Chabra. Can I go to the first question a little bit also because that is also linked to this, if with your permission. Please. Uh, you know, my understanding is that gold is not going back to those kind of phenotypes of chronic bronchitis and emphysema. In the definition is very clear that word it is used as bronchitis, not chronic bronchitis. And it is airway abnormality that leads to airflow limitation which means it is not chronic bronchitis it is referring to. It's referring to bronchitis with airflow limitation. And there is a separate para on chronic bronchitis, where it says it's an associated condition present in about one third patients of COPD and is a risk factor for COPD. So the way we look at chronic bronchitis now is little different from those days of, uh, you know, blue bloaters and all. That was a different kind of sure. look, right? Now about uh, pre-COPD and gold uh, zero, in the first gold guidelines, there was a stage zero, but those were five gold stages within this umbrella of COPD. What gold 2023 has done is just kept pre-COPD as not yet in COPD. Sure. So it's a stage which is preceding COPD. So that is one vital difference. Stage zero was a stage of COPD. Pre-COPD is not yet COPD, but may go into COPD later on. So any symptoms, structural abnormalities, functional abnormality that don't meet the standard gold criteria of obstruction. You know, I always tell my student the word COPD, the O is your post bronchiolar ratio less than 70. If that is not there, gold doesn't define it as COPD. So all other conditions like uh, pre-COPD or PRISM, these are risk factors who if we follow them, possibly they will go into COPDs. So like the trial that you mentioned that failed, now that was probably in my humble opinion an incorrect hypothesis when obstruction is not there yet, why treat with bronchodilators? So that trial was bound to show negative results. But having said that, it doesn't mean that we have nothing to offer to these patients. These patients have to be identified and lifestyle modification, you know, paying attention to the risk factors which led to this condition, like smoking cessation or adopting measures in those occupations where they are exposed or Im improving uh, the household chulas where the ladies are exposed. So these are preventive measures which can be taken. So identifying this population is very, very important from a long-term perspective that if we, they don't go into COPD, they don't suffer all the problems of COPD. So sure. pre-COPD is a very important stage like a primary prevention of COPD. Sure. We intervene at this stage. So identification is very, very important. How we identify is a little difficult because these patients are unlikely to reach the physician in the first place because they are not glycemic. So catching them is a problem. But for sure, it is a very important population. And Gold, I think, has uh, done a great job in identifying PRISM and pre-COPD as potential COPD candidates for future and where primary prevention can be done. Sure. Wonderful, Dr. Chabra. So what you're saying is it's important to identify this population. However, when they're treating this population, when there's no bronchoconstriction, airway remodeling is something which we don't know as yet. It's probably not going to work, but following these people up would be useful. So let me sort of stay with you for a minute. I know along with being an astute clinician, you're one of the best physiologists we have in this country, Dr. Chabra. So suppose this population of patients came to you in clinic with cough, with phlegm, with symptoms of exacerbation, which have been treated by a GP with maybe two to three courses of antibiotics in a year. You know, the chronic bronchitis yes, phenotype yes. of patients. Yes. You do a spirometry in this patient and by spirometric criteria, the patient does not have COPD. However, you identify an environmental trigger in this patient. So you know that maybe there's biomass, maybe there's smoking, some environmental trigger. So would you just ask this patient to maybe give them a bit of anti-allergic or maybe give them a course of antibiotics and send them home and say, do an annual spirometry with me and we'll see how the symptoms progress before we prescribe drugs. Or would you think about prescribing inhalers to this population of patients, whatever inhalers, maybe not bronchodilators, maybe you would give a laba ICS. What would be your approach in treating someone who has a significant symptom burden, but normal spirometry by COPD criteria? Uh, yeah, a very good question. I think uh, the rethink study clearly shows that these pop this population is not 
the right population for bronchiolitis now steroids would be definitely contraindicated in this population unless they have an asthmatic component so that takes a different route altogether so if it's only cough and expectoration then there's certainly no indication for uh, corticosteroid so <clears throat> as far as current pharmacotherapy is concerned there is very little we can offer to this population sure. but if there is infection you know documented by say uh, systemic response fever or change in color of sputum definitely antibiotics and that would be the acute bronchitis kind of presentation in these patients sure. so prevention again remains the key you know like if they are smokers sure. we sure. take anti smoking measures including uh, drug therapy for smoking cessation so whether follow up is going to help again depends on the rate of progress uh, so far there is no annual screening program anywhere in the world so to have a regular scheduled screening is probably not going to work but one can always educate them that in case there is any degree of breathlessness definitely they require a reevaluation because yeah. when pre copd goes into copd one cannot say very easily sure. so one has to wait and that's the emphasis on symptoms which gold is yeah yeah so, so any change means that they have progress further yeah so i was just going to say morli that if you want to add these are emotive these are sort of very i know people are very passionate about this topic and there's sort of more than one opinion that can happen so if you <laughs> just put up your hand like uh, murli did or the way i have done it just now on the panel and we'll come to you so i'll go to sanjeev but before that murli a quick comment and then we'll go to sanjeev yeah two two things i wanted to mention one is i don't really see raja I agree with you on the stage 0 gold and you know the pre copd being not very different because even in stage 0 gold they said this is at risk for copd which to my mind is not very different they defined it as normal spirometry but with symptoms in somebody with risk factors to my mind that's very similar and we've just given it a different name uh, professor chabra i wanted to ask you and when i was learning pathology and you know how smoking copd progress they spoke about a stage of chronic chronic simple bronchitis where there was no obstruction just mucus hypersecretion and then it went on to uh, chronic obstructive bronchitis which is roughly what we're talking about now but wo- both were bronchitis okay and i wonder and i i know you're a skeptic about impulse oscillometry i know atri is very passionate about impulse oscillometry more and more i am getting very fond of impulse oscillometry do you think that's a way to pick up these early copds raja professor chabra anybody else is that a way to pick up early copd which is been missed spirometrically but will be picked up by impulse oscillometry so you have a, a reason to intervene early uh not a more i'm uh, not skeptic about impulse oscillometry i'm only waiting for science to validate it and so far science has not validated it you know for any test to become a diagnostic test it has to clearly differentiate a population from a non affected population so we need a positive predictive value sensitivity and validation which so far has not been done so that is why i'm waiting for science to give me reason to use it it may be a test for the future but so far it has not been validated so yeah. that is why so if science validates it definitely it will be a test for future so all that is future so more research is required so by all means i am with you we will validate it if it works definitely we do it but as of now it is not validated for pcopd and in fact gold 23 they must have scanned all the literature not a single word about impulse oscillometry in the whole document yeah so at just to add so i am in the same boat as uh, uh, dr chabra i'll i'll tell you my take uh, which is which you will find interesting so we are just in the middle of setting up a study similar to rethink but looking at the pre copd population in 10 different centers in india where we have actually factored in impulse oscillometry or fot and we have put a criteria in looking at the literature so i think the jury is still out mm-hmm. we understand that small airways disease is something that gets picked up better by impulse oscillometry or by fot by oscillometry and you know people like rajesh atri etc have used a lot more of ice oscillometry as compared to what i have i mean i have used oscillometry for a while but my understanding is not great to be honest but i accept that i think going forward 
this is probably going to be a very good screening physiological tool, which spirometry is not going to be going forward. That's that's my sort of two penny worth about uh, oscillometry. And I will add just one sentence. We recognize that impulse oscillometry or FOT is complementary to uh, spirometry. And we are missing out on some of the benefits of iOS because we are using spirometry as the gold standard. Yeah. And we're trying to measure apples against oranges, which yeah. is not a very good idea. Yeah. yeah but we need tools to separate out the two very clearly. Yeah. And that's why the research is yeah. still on in that direction. Yeah. So I think other... Uh, even if it's not mentioned in gold, uh, there is actually a paper, what's called Lancet Commission on COPD, mm -hmm. which also yeah. is talks about elimination of COPD. And that's a very ambitious uh, actually paper, if you read it. There, it is actually mentioned that basically oscillometry is, it is it is going to be the tool to actually pick up this pre pre I mean, COPD in this thing. Yeah, that's uh, what I'm saying. It's for future, no? for maybe 2025, 27, in some of the future gold line guidelines, it will come. Yeah, so I'm quite, uh, I'm this. Uh, It'll be quite sooner, in fact, so because we got just we just got a lot of papers now coming up, which is saying that it is quite sensitive than experimentally to pick up small airway disease, and and hence. <clears throat> so one quick comment, Atri, and then we'll move on to the next question, Atri. First time the gold guideline has actually mentioned impulse oscillometry, but they have used the term for small airway disease in this gold guideline, especially where they were talking about CT. To look in the emphysema, they have mentioned that an impulse oscillometry is a very good adjunct tool for small airway disease, number one. Secondly, if we talk about science evidence of impulse oscillometry, as early as 1995, there has been published multinational trial on COPD where it has been more sensitive than spirometry and not pediatric. I'm talking COPD as early as 1995. Every two or three years, good studies have been published. And when we are talking about PRISM or pre-COPD in Indian population, there is always something known as ACO, ACO. And there we see impulse oscillometry picks up reversibility much better than a conventional spirometry. And treating them as an ACO based on that impulse oscillometry finding is actually helping the patient. And I would not say future. Currently in India, over 10 centers are doing this regularly in regular practice yeah. and we can say it is the present but yes let's wait one or two years i am sure it will come into the guidelines very forcefully yeah so actually let's sort of put this together i think this discussion about ios we so oscillometry we need to put into perspective and my understanding from everything that all of you have said is that we all understand and believe that the small airways are looked at much better by oscillometry be that ios or fot as compared to what spirometry does we think that the small airways is affected more. We think is the crucial word here that the small airways are affected more by the environmental insults I spoke about a little while ago and hence should be better identified by oscillometry. However, as Dr. Chabra says, the challenge is that we don't have reference values till now. We don't really know what are the parameters that we need to look at. And while we recognize this is for the future, and as Burli said, apples and oranges, I think these are complementary to each other rather than one replacing the other. But it's more watch this space now and be it one year, two years, five years, we don't know. But we will have information in this space maybe when the next gold guidance comes in. So that's my message to the audience. So that's what all of us are saying. We're not saying different things, audience. We are just saying that it's something to watch out for and it's going to be important. So let me come to Sanjeev next. Sanjeev, my question to you, maybe in continuation with what I'd asked Dr. Chabra is, you know, you probably have the largest cohort of COPD patients I know, actually. I mean, you see multiple COPD patients way more than I see, and I see quite a lot. Uh, you also see people who probably come in with this category of patients, which we have named pre-COPD or the early COPD or the PRISM population. So my question to you is, this patient comes to you. So suppose this is a 45-year-old gentleman who is lives in a rural area, has exposure to biomass, not much of pollution, but smokes BD and does that for 20 years, has cough, brings up phlegm, two to three courses of antibiotics every year, maybe has had a sputum done, which has shown a gram negative in the past, comes to you. You do a spirometry. The spirometry by criteria of gold today is normal. So in this category of patients, do you say come back and see me after three months? 
I will not give you any medication other than a course of antibiotics or maybe a mucolytic. Would you say I will start you on an ICS and a LABA if the eosinophil counts are high? Would you say, please come back in six months time or do you say, I'll do an annual spirometry for you? How do you follow these patients up for the audience today? Yeah, uh, it's a difficult question, uh, Raja. <laughs> when it comes to me, I think Dr. Chabra has sort of taken it up that uh, in terms of scientific uh, evidence, we really don't have anything to offer to these patients based on science. You know, he has very clearly explained that neither can we give a bronchodilator to a patient who has no uh, obstruction on a spirometer, and nor, nor can you actually go with the ICS uh, lava unless, of course, you're giving you know a lot of ifs and buts there where you're saying a high eosinophil count and specific exposures and all that. So it's a difficult situation altogether. Uh, if you permit me, I go a step backwards. You know, if you look at, uh, uh, in fact, when the new gold guidelines came, it, uh, kind of critique that we did our own department, I went back and borrowed, I mean, took some of my slides from 2014. And if you look at those slides, which was basically based on the COPD gene study, at that time, I not only had a COPD zero in that, I also had a, you know, COPD U, which gold, I mean, the COPD gene study brought out, which actually is the equivalent of your, you know, prism today. So sure. these entities are actually identified long back. It keeps coming and going out and we are still not clear. If you look at the the way it has been worded, you're, you're having pre-COPD, then you have a prism where your spirometry is getting impaired and then you have spiro, you know, your COPD where your F1 by physical bronchodilator is less than 70%. So it would imply that this goes in a, you know, it's progressing from uh, pre-COPD to prism to uh, COPD or something like that. And people might understand like that. But in your own talk, you're very clear in that, you know, certain proportion may progress. Dr. Chabra was also saying that way. We still are not sure what proportion are actually going to progress and uh, how it should be evaluated. I would agree with you that I definitely would keep these people under observation. They would definitely come back to me. I might do a uh, second spirometry for them, look at whether they are actually developing obstruction. But at this point of time, when the patient comes to me, I mean, I might place a bit of emphasis on my clinical examination and the symptoms. Uh, having said, uh, having agreed with Dr. Chabra that, you know, there may not be a scientific uh, evidence-based logic on starting a bronchodilator or a ICS lava, but at times I do see that in our patients, these two get started. Now, sure. going back one step again, uh, the other side of the story is the reality in India. I mean, uh, we had done a study which uh, looked at COPD patients, one, treated by pathologists. In that cohort, uh, we found that only 70%, less than 70%, about 64% are actually undergone a spirometry. So even among pulmonologists, it's not 100% of sure. spirometry being done. And we had another study which looked at physicians, GPs, and all treating COPD. And now the percentage who underwent spirometry was somewhere around 10%. So we have to understand that in India, vast majority of our so-called diagnosed COPD would not have a spirometry. And being in a tertiary care center, I'm sure that all of you would agree that most of the COPD coming to us are already on treatment. So, you know, I'll take your question one step forward that you have a patient who is already on an ICS lab or already on a, you know, bronchodilator, has all the symptoms and the exposure to say that this is a COPD. Now that the spirometry is not done, because I believe in spirometry and that I can make a diagnosis only on spirometry, I go ahead and do a spirometry and now I find it's a pre-COPD or I find it's a prism. It's more difficult for me because the patient is on treatment. Patient supposedly is claiming that he's responding to the treatment. And there I think I have no choice but to you know, continue the treatment. Maybe modify it if I feel that the steroid is not warranted yeah. to the patient. I might change it to a bronchodilator or something. So... That is more of the reality that we will be seeing, you know, at least sitting in a tertiary care reform institution. Sure. Most of my patients go through multiple consultations before they come to me. And often it's at my center that the spirometry gets done for the first time. And that is where I diagnose the pre-COPD and the prism. And then I have to take a decision on a patient who is already on pre. So, you know, it's a, it's a quite a difficult situation. And I don't think that I have any scientific answers to that. But of course, I would agree that uh, treatment might be offered to the patient because at the end of the day, Sure. He's coming to you for some care and there is nothing else. You said multiple courses of antibiotics, a lot of oral bronchodilators, which probably none of the guidelines tell you to give a lot of uh, different kinds sure. of theophilins. So there I would feel that the inhaler probably is safer to the patient and maybe do better than going through a cocktail yeah. of antibiotics and uh, you know, sure. oral. Yeah. So uh, I have seen your hand, Agam. So I'll 
just say a couple of things and come to you. I think your statement probably would be more pertinent. I can sort of, I've known you for long. I can guess what you're going to say. So um, two things. The first is, I think the point Sanjeev makes is important. You know, if you have patients who come to you post some form of inhaler treatment and you find that the patient's spirometry is normal, you probably are almost compelled to continue with the treatment or change the treatment to a more evidence-based treatment because you cannot tell whether the normal spirometry is secondary to whatever treatment the patient has had or whether it's de novo. So you don't know that. And I think that's an important point. The reason I'm asking the question, Sanjeev, and sort of I'll come to Agam for a comment, is that there are two studies that I know of. One is a 23-year-old, 23-year-long longitudinal study looking at people who have environmental triggers with a normal spirometry where patients in Canada were followed up for that period of time, the 23 years, with an environmental trigger. First, very little symptoms, then significant symptoms. And 70% uh, of these people developed clinical obstruction over a 23 period, a year period. 70%. That's a large number. Then there's one Finnish study, which did something similar and found about 55% of patients went on to develop COPD. So the question, I think, in my mind is, in asthma, Gina has recommended, and we've got good data to show, that the inhaled corticosteroid comes in early, prevents airway remodeling. A lot of these patients that we think are pre-COPD COPD, could also be ACO, for instance. So do we just follow these patients up, wait for obstruction to develop, and then start the bronchodilator or the inhaled corticosteroid? Or do we start off, and does that, in a way, prevent the disease from progressing over a period of time? Aga. <clears throat> yeah, but I was trying to probably answer in the same way that one is you said a patient who's clinically COPD, you have cough, sputum production, everything that you said, and the spirometry when it was done did not show obstructive pattern. What you would want to see as COPD. So your question is, what would you do? I think one is what would I label it as, and second, what would I treat him as? So I think I may label him as whatever, uh, uh, you know, prism, or I may pre COPD or whatever I label him as. But my treatment would be definitely on COPD guidance. So I would continue, uh, I mean, I would start this patient on a uh, bronchodilator for sure. Now, again, that is debatable whether to start with one uh, bronchodilator or dual bronchodilator, etc. But I would put him on treatment as COPD for sure. That is what I wanted to say. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Chabra. See, again, uh, we have to be logical in our treatment, you know, and talk to the patient. Rethink study clearly shows that there is no benefit. So uh, today we are talking of evidence-based approach. So that may work till we have no evidence with us. But once spirometry has been done and patient is still pre-COPD, then I think it would be over treatment to put him on a dual bronchodilator because the evidence shows it doesn't work. Sure. No, but sir, would you, would you want to continue treatment and observe him again at the end of three months? If there is symptomatic treatment, you would definitely continue that whatever the see, spirometry or literature says. We have to see what is the cause of his symptoms. You know, if the patient only has cough and expectoration and he's exposed to an environmental trigger, the cause is there. If he has breathlessness, we have to explore other possible causes of breathlessness in this patient. Could yeah. be diastolic dysfunction, sure. could be deconditioning. So we can't start treatment with bronchodilators when there is no objective evidence to show that there is bronchospasm. The rethink study clearly shows it doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. So there's one thing about the rethink study, uh, Dr. Chabra, which is sort of the fine print of the rethink study, which is the primary endpoint that they use was the CAT score. Now, we have all discussed just now about having some form of oscillometry physiological parameter. You know, this is subject. It was a three-month study, 12-week study. Can you actually make a change in symptoms just by giving them any form of bronchodilator or ICS? And the last line of the rethink study concludes by saying, we look forward to a study which looks at a LABA ICS combination in this category of patients. So I think rather than sort of continuing this discussion, our message to the audience is that you probably wouldn't be wrong going either way. If your patient does not have a large burden of symptoms, if the patient has not had previous inhaler therapy of any form, it might be prudent to just wait. On the other hand, if your patient has significant symptoms, and if you've excluded things like bronchiectasis, for instance, by doing a CT, what you said, Dr. Chabra, very relevant. If the patient has an ongoing trigger, is exposed to biomass, for instance, or is smoking, for instance, you try and take that away and you do good things like vaccination and so on in this population of patients. 
you could probably wait and follow up the patient. On the other hand, another category of patient, large burden of symptoms, multiple exacerbations, coughing, no bronchiectasis. Maybe a trial of inhaled treatment might not be a bad idea. Both of what we are saying are probably not evidence-based. So I think you cannot go wrong by any of these two approaches is my not understanding. Inhaled corticosteroids, not inhaled steroids. You know, I would be very skeptical to use sure. inhaled steroids. In this yeah. So the only point about inhaled steroids, Dr. Chabra, is to make sure that this patient does not have an ACU. You know, if this patient has asthma, for instance, if you go back and find that this patient has allergic rhinitis, for instance, in childhood, a family history, for instance, then probably using a LABA IC has become justified in this population. That is a different thing. There, yeah, you are sure. working on atopy yeah. and evidence of asthma. Yeah. If it is yeah. there, definitely steroids would be indicated. Sure. sure, sure. So I'll move on and I'll go to the other very interesting question. Very interesting, equally interesting, if not more, to Murli. Murli, uh, this is about etiotypes. You know, we went. I didn't go into great detail because I knew that um, you would do that for us. But the the two questions. One is these etiotypes being identified, the fact that they are being mentioned with acronyms to it, do you think the consciousness of a, a sort of average physician, GP, primary, uh, secondary care would actually go up and people would think, okay, this can be COPD even though this is a non-smoker. That's one relevance. Do you think there is also any other clinical relevance in the way of management of these individuals? What is the importance to us as Indians in this country with a lot of ambient air pollution, a lot of overlap? You know, you can have of someone living in Delhi who smokes, who lives in the suburbs and actually has biomass going on. All of these factors could overlap together. So what's the significance of these etiotypes? How do you tease them apart? And what's the significance for a clinician who sat in front of a patient uh, with a patient, maybe in greater Noida? Uh the the problem is, uh, you know, this is something Professor Chabra is also fairly clear about, that we don't have strong evidence to say that these are separate phenotypes. So I think we should be very clear about this. These are indications by the gold guidelines to tell us, sorry, again, I keep using the word gold guidelines. These are not guidelines. This is a strategy report. So it's the gold strategy to tell us that these are possible different etiological causes. They've put in a taxonomy. The acronyms or the abbreviations, I don't think make a lot of sense. They're really not going to be remembered by even you and me. You know, we are not really interested in the differentiation between a gold COPD D and a COPD G. Uh, but I think it's very important that they've drawn attention to the fact that COPD is not a monolithic disease with just one cause, as we were taught all these years. Over the last 15 or 20 years, we've learned that there are different, uh, you know, things that can lead to uh, COPD starting in, uh, not just in birth, but from womb to tomb, that there are uh, important events in life which can start before birth. Uh, in the mother, for example, we know that smoking mothers, the children are more likely to develop COPD. In the Indian context, how important maternal nutrition is to prevent, you know, small, uh, low, low birth weight babies, very low birth weight babies and so on. So I think from that point of view, it indicates an interesting, uh, it's an interesting pointer to think beyond just smoking or even non-smoking COPD. Don't think of adult exposure to these uh, noxious fumes to decide that this is COPD. So I think that's the interesting part of it. From a clinician point of view, I think we're going to think about A, what is the etiology in this person? Should I think of multiple etiologies? Because there clearly is an overlap of many things. I think you have mentioned, you know, COPD asthma. It, does it become two different etiologies or is it one impacting the other to increase the probability of developing COPD? Going back to the questions that you asked earlier about pre-COPD, this is a group with asthma who also already have small lungs who are likely to be somebody I would like to intervene early and screen more regularly for the possibility of uh, COPD and follow them up more carefully with somebody else without these risk factors, I probably would not. So that's me as a clinician. 
Perhaps another role uh, as a clinician is when I see a person with previous evidence of tuberculosis predisposing to TB, I would be even more cautious about using inhaled steroids, which we know increases the risk of reactivation of TB. So those are those things as a clinician. But I'd like to go a little beyond that and say, you know, when I'm looking at somebody with uh, COPD, I wonder if this could have been prevented in the past by, you know, better care of the mother and therefore... I was talking at one of our COPD programs recently, the best of chest and saying that maybe we need to get involved as clinicians more into advocacy, you know, talking about how important maintaining maternal nutrition is and maintaining how important pollution measure, anti-pollution measures are not just in the household, out of the household, but very importantly for little children and how to keep mothers safe. So to, for me, uh, you know, putting in these etiotypes of COPD brings all those things into the forefront. And I'd really like us to start thinking of those things when we see a patient with COPD and how important our role is, not just as clinicians, but also as, you know, maybe public consciences when it comes to preserving lung health of our people. Yeah, that's beautifully put, Murli. Thank you. So I'll come to you, uh, Sanjeev, in a moment. So I think what you're basically saying is that, A, for a clinician, it makes you think of these etiologies. And you know, in ASPA, we used to thinking of triggers. You would go in th through a list of triggers, whereas till date when you studied medicine, I studied medicine, it was more about, is this patient a smoker? Tick, non-smoker, think of other diseases. Now we understand there's a list that you need to go through. And there are other causes aside from smoking, which can be as important stimuli for COPD as smoking is, if not more. So that's one. The other you said is about prognostication about follow-up of these patients, about disease scores, and the individual etiology would also tell you how you would follow these patients up in the long term, depending on what is the causative factor for the COPD. So points very nicely put and taken. And I also love the bit you said about advocacy and about undernutrition of the mother and so on. So thank you. Let me come to Sanjeev. Sanjeev, you've got your hand up. You know, up. Raja, I wish I had said it that way. You put it far better than I did. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sanjeev. Uh yeah, I totally agree with uh, what Dr. Glimowen said. Uh, but the point here, you know, we are talking about the Indian context, and you rightly said that, you know, the current data it shows that around 70% uh, of the COPD in India is not smoking COPD. Now, all of us sitting here, we are also leaders in terms of, you know, guiding COPD care in the country. So I think in terms of the advocacy thing that Dr. Glimowen was saying, I'm taking it one step ahead, you know. If you look at the Indian guidelines for non-communicable disease, it was hardly addressing COPD which was the number two killer in India. So that guideline was not even addressing COPD. Yeah. About five, six years back, they started addressing COPD and they were looking only at COPD prevention and they had only one way of doing it and that was smoking cessation. And now when 70% of your COPD are non-smokers, if you're just doing smoking cessation, yeah. it just doesn't address the COPD in India. And now having these atyotypes, COPD you know, uh, C and your COPD I and your COPD P, yeah. That's a way to tell your administrators, your policymakers, and your you know physician colleagues around that this is something that you need to keep in mind, and that in terms of prevention and even secondary prevention in terms of progression, preventing progression, this is very important. Now, one yeah. thing I always you know for the last few years, what I've been remembering is that you know whenever even we talk about when we have a talk on COPD, we always put in a slide or maybe many slides on smoking cessation. But we hardly ever put anything on other risk factor reduction. Yeah, absolutely. It's not there yeah. on any of our slides. You look at any of our old presentations. And if you look at the current gold, it actually talks of risk factor reduction. And reducing uh, biomass exposure is something that each of us should be speaking about. Now, if you put in these etiotypes, you are compelled to even talk about prevention. In fact, we have published a bit on that. And we have shown that India has surprisingly or not, rather should be proud about it that we have really reduced the biomass exposure yeah. in our households probably because the transition to the cooking gas which yeah. happened in our country as compared to say our neighboring countries pakistan or bangladesh where that change has not really occurred whereas india it has really yeah. gone a long way forward and we should actually put in our bit into that so i think that is very important for us and that idiotype should be used uh, you know yeah Love that. to do yeah. good for our copd patients yeah. so quick comment and from Raja, atri and a quick comment from dr chabra and then i'll move to the next question and get rajesh in so atri first and then dr other chabra. than yes. other than oscillometry something very passionate i am is air pollution first time i am seeing a guideline 
that is talking so much about yeah. non smoking copd very soon the further guideline will have a separate section on air pollution copd including unique investigation or management event so maybe that is also the future or our present practice changing yeah. ask question about air pollution be familiarize about i want to tell to the audience over there all of you when you are treating copd you should know what aqi is familiarize about aqi yeah. ask your patient about air pollution maybe that is the future yeah yeah and for advocacy you can put pressure on the government if all the doctors all the patients together start talking about air pollution and anti pollution fair point at three one line dr chabra got hundreds of questions in the box yeah. this uh, advocacy about pollution and its impact is nothing new for 20 years this has been going on you know the central government has formed a ministry of non conventional sources of energy that's almost two decades and we had studies on impact of air pollution on lung health uh, dating almost two decades back now the world is waking up to this because uh, it was predominantly you know the western thought which was dominating now they are giving respect yeah. to our opinions that yeah. is why it is coming others we have been aware about this not that we are waking up that air pollution is causing we knew this for 20 years uh, yeah the we west did, but i think yes yeah. And yeah, Raja, in terms of yeah, yeah. Raji, in terms yeah. of advocacy, mm -hmm. we should also actually what is called national program for COPD. So it is actually second, second of the biggest killer in the in India, and of, and uh, and we don't have any of the national program for that. So that is so intriguing yeah. to in, in fact know, yeah. and that yeah. could be one of the advocacy from us. In fact, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <clears throat> So Rajesh, let me shift tack a little. I think we have discussed this important point threadbare. So let's move on, and I'll come to you with a very interesting question. So this is. about tb which i think got spoken about a little while ago and you know we are doing reasonably well i think with uh, our tb eradication program the ngp program however our program finishes the day you finish anti tubercular drug therapy you know you finish there the patient goes home happy the dot center is happy the patient gets discharged this emerging evidence from south africa then our own studies which show that is significant percentage and if i quote our study which we presented in years uh, a little while ago about 20% of patients with significant parenchymal fibrosis which is more than one low peak fibros will develop some degree of spirometry defined copd over a period of 5 year period right so the numbers were small in the study the the south african study actually shows a higher percentage at 33% when there's more than one lobe involved our numbers are small but the fact remains that there would be a percentage of people who would develop airway obstruction now your thoughts about this significant proportion which probably will come into the fore after biomass following these patients up do you think you would call these patients back to clinic for a spirometry in 6 months time only if they are symptomatic do you think this is significant and then if it is significant how would you think about treating these individuals i know a lot of this is hypothetical but gold has put this in this tb in bold in the gold guidelines this time so i think this is worth discussing yes as you have said earlier that pulmonary and systemic infections are among the most important non smoking related risk factors for us chronic lung diseases you have said about uh, and it also especially in these lower and also middle income uh, local countries and an estimate of 10 to but 42% of people with early life pneumonia and tb hiv do have actually copd and tb is of course a major health problem uh, in our in our country and there is actually a strong association between history of tuberculosis and also development of copd in a non smoking patient and it is true that despite successful treatment of tuberculosis impaired impaired of lung function often of risk persist and basic risk of airvo air force limitation in you know, also patient with a history of tuberculosis is actually more than twice that is that in patients with no with no history of tuberculosis but as you said that we we would need basically a follow up what we do is that we would just forget this patients once once they have got akt and then uh, they would they, they would just never come back i think that probably we can how can make them aware about about having cough and also what recurrences afterwards and then if they can come back to the clinic maybe every about 6 months or so and if we can do this testing by by just like a simple just what to call spirometry i think it would go a long way in actually picking up this tb tb tuberculosis which they come actually later 
they would they would have first present to you but then uh, after after so many years so i think that at least sort of spermetry at the end of tb treatment it is what we need and uh, i think this would be also incorporated in our uh, ndp program and uh, and actually we should also bring this fact out in our out also in a white paper and actually give it to ntp chairman and uh, yeah and the chairman now that it has come also in the gold uh, yeah so i think sure. this would be interesting uh, i mean thing to happen and uh, i think there is a study going on by rrn in fact which is yes. in which she also participated tb tb and uh, tb yeah for the copd and yeah. i think uh, it would be it would be quite interesting to see its results so we just writing up that paper at the moment rajesh so that's yeah. the paper i was quoting and we'll have data it does not need to be a white paper we'll actually have good data on this so i can see two hands quick words sanjeev short comment from sanjeev and then from dr chabra Uh, uh, the comment i want to make mainly is that you know the program the ntp program today in india has a guideline that after the treatment completion after cure patient has to be followed up for two years so six monthly clinical follow up but that program is basically looking at recurrence of tb and there is recognition with the tb prevalence study that there is a lot of tb occurring in previously treated patients now there is a opportunity for us to piggy back that yeah since your program is but the reality is that part of it because the program is already overburden that follow up part of it is not happening the program because of the national program study is now trying to push that and make that happen so that's a right opportunity for uh, for us you know dr rajesh could probably uh, push that into the program mm-hmm. and program i'm sure would be willing to take it up do a spirometry also along yeah. with it people will come back for follow up if you are offering something other than tb so we yeah. people believe they have been cured of tb and they don't want to come back to know if they have tb again but now if you are offering lung health people will come back and they will have a high yield of recurrence of tb being diagnosed also and the patient has a benefit in terms of copd by being diagnosed also yeah. so i think there is a opportunity there the program is very clear that every 6 month patient is followed up for 2 years so it's a question yeah. of making it happen and a spirometry being built into that program. so sanjeev and has always have learned something new from you today of, and we're yeah, so, scared of doing extra spirometry in these it is for patient because of they are just tb patient so yeah. it might be that also fear that we don't follow up these patients and don't do yeah. i think of spirometry yeah. in these patients yeah i was going to say that um, i have learned something new today i did not actually realize that these patients of tb are supposed to be followed up for 2 years for recurrence so thank you for that sanjeev the other thing i wanted to say is again from the study that you quoted uh, rajesh the rrn study uh, or the erstwhile rrn i study is that the obstruction seem to happen not at completion of treatment but at least a year post that you know so that. it's probably even more relevant what sanjeev said just now that the follow up should be for a longer period rather than at the end of treatment saying okay your spirometry is fine tick box you can go back it needs to be a more prolonged follow up as compared to that dr chabra see uh, uh, this post tubercular sclerosis is very common and one of the favorite uh, topics for thesis for dnb is post tubercular abnormalities so hundreds of thesis on this and uh, dr nair has already said that it should be part of the follow up and i believe in one country i am aware korea they have a system of uh, checkups for all kinds of post tubercular problems and we need to have a policy and gold has done a very good thing to point out that tuberculosis the word cure doesn't end the problem for tuberculosis it remains there after all so So yeah. we need a policy in our program. Yeah. So we all agreed. We need a policy, guys, and let's push for it. Maybe this could be a platform where we come up with a white paper to push this forward and say we need to integrate spirometry into the two-year follow-up that Sanjeev and the others spoke about. So uh, to get you into the discussion, Atri, I'm sorry for not to pose the questions. Got two questions for you. The first one I wanted to talk to you about was this separate mention of chronic bronchitis. Now we discussed it a little while ago, but you know it talks about. 33% of the population of COPD patients having chronic bronchitis it talks about gastroesophageal reflux to the to the best of my knowledge for the very first time separately in the chronic bronchitis basket how important is this for you as a clinician seeing patients with COPD in large numbers on a regular basis and how would this help to change treatment if at all in your population of patients with chronic bronchitis Okay. Before I start, I want to be thank the universe for conspiring to bring me here. My parents belong to a generation they spent their college weekends watching Amitabh Bachchan movies. 
I spent my college weekend listening to Dr. Raja Dhar talk at various conferences at Calcutta, <laughs> and then I went to Delhi. I found Dr. Chhabra used to be examiner in most of the cases. Finding myself in a webinar with them is very exhilarating for me. So, when I read the various guidelines, what I found is people realized that GERD was more important for a less common disease that is ILD. ILD, lung fibrosis, GERD talks have been going on for a very long time. Then someone realized, oh, if GERD can be there in pulmonary fibrosis, can GERD also be there in COPD? And suddenly we find that they have actually mentioned GERD in COPD this time. Whenever we are talking about chronic bronchitis, since it's a clinical definition, importance of clinical symptom relief comes. So I am sure after reading this paper, I would want to change my practice by mandatory talking about GERD anti-reflux therapy to my patients of chronic bronchitis, definitely. This would be practice changing for me. Another yeah. very quick comment. Yeah. Often I ask myself that how many doctors follow the guideline or should I follow the guideline? But I realized that COPD being so common and COPD potentially being fatal and deadly. If we as specialists stick to the guideline for COPD, because these guidelines are made by people who have devoted their life to COPD for two or three decades, and they sift through every possible evidence, regard it, disregard it, and keep space for arguments also. So for a disease like COPD, if you stick to the guideline, you will actually help your patient. You will reduce the mortality. You will reduce the rate of exacerbation. So my answer is yes, I would change my practice. Consider GERD aggressively in cough-based COPD patients where I am suspecting a chronic bronchitis predominant phenotype. Yeah. So I'll come to Agam uh, first and then go to you, Murli. Uh, just something I want to add before you start, Agam, which is, you know, the there's another context. So I agree with what Atri said. I think it's relevant. But to add to it, you know, there's been this recent change in the ILD guidance, where at one point of time, it used to say that this is something which has got a soft evidence. And, you know, the entire ILD IPF basket has only got soft positive recommendations. It does not have a hard positive recommendation as such. And anti-reflux treatment was one of those. And now you find that plication therapy in patients with ILD does not help. Hence the inference that routine treatment with a course of gastro anti-GRD treatment does not really help. You have also got your API hat, Agam. So do you think this is probably a bit of over-promotion of anti-GRD treatment or do you think there can be a balance between the two? Agam. No, I wanted to say the same thing. I think it would be a little overstretching uh, about GRD, you have only small subset of patients where you have, refer it's like asthma, you know, when you have uncontrolled asthma, only in those situations when you're thinking of plus things, you know, what you have missed, maybe allergic retinitis, obesity and GRD is one of those things. But then think about GRD in every patient uh, would be over treating. And similarly in chronic bronchitis, I think there is clear evidence that if you treat patients unnecessarily with it, it puts them at a higher risk of actually getting infections. There were some studies, I, I don't remember where I read, but I'm sure everybody here would know that. When you put them on unnecessary, uh, uh, you know, uh, anti-acidity treatment or anti-reflux treatment, it may actually put them at a higher risk of getting infections. I believe I would consider this only in small subset of patients where they're continuing to be symptomatic in spite of my ruling out other things where I will have one of those things in checklist, but then to treat everybody for GRD would be, at this stage, I'm not really willing to do so. Yeah. Yeah. So Murli and then Dr. Chabra, quick comments, please. No, I, I, I really don't have anything else to what you and Agam have said, except to say, you know, I completely agree with Atri that following guidelines is important, but it's also important to keep updated with the guidelines because the guidelines are changing so fast. You know, from if you look at the gap between the different gold uh, documents, the time is shortening significantly and each time the evidence is getting stronger. So follow the guidelines, but keep updated with the guidelines. The rest of it, I completely agree with you. As Agam said, anti-reflux medication is associated with greater problems than we realize. In order to be effective, you need to use a PPI for at least two months. And that will definitely increase the risk of A, 
pneumonias and such, and B, increase the risk of being colonized by the harmful bio microbiome. So I, I'd be very careful on just treating patients automatically. Absolutely agree with Dr. Mohan and Dr. Vora. See, unfortunately, pantoprazole is probably the large, widest prescribed medicine in India today. Every prescription has it. Unfortunately. Yeah. You only have to use where it is clinically indicated. Yeah, yeah. And a warm welcome to Krishna Bhai. I can see him. Krishna Bhai, welcome. Um, good to see you on the webinar. Uh, very warm welcome. Um, let me go back to Atri again. Atri, I had another question and maybe a short answer. This was about this, the role of CT in the gold guidance of 2023. You know, if you look through the guidance, it's actually spent four pages. It took me about 20 minutes to digest what they've written on those four pages. I want you to tell me in today's clinical practice, as a clinician, the way you practice, how do you position CT? And how would you position CT in the context of what's been written in the gold 2022 guidance? As CT becomes more and more readily available, the number of pages behind CT will increase. CT helps us to select patients for surgery. Upper lobe, localized predominant disease, consider surgery. Only CT can diagnose that, no other test will. And these patients, if they get the right intervention, something endobronchial for an upper lobe localized disease, then the patient's life actually changes. CT helps in another unique diagnosis, which can be confounding. That is that combined fibrosis emphysema subtype. So CT will help us to select patients for interventions early. A early intervention is any day better than a botched late intervention leading to lots of complications. Other than that, ACOPD, maybe a CT will pick up a pneumothorax fastest compared to any other test. So wider reach, more CT, but it will help. Yeah, it will probably also a 3B in that population of pre-COPD where mm. Dr. Chabra mentioned about looking for other etiologies for the cough and phlegm that we spoke about, you know, that particular population. And that's why if you look at all these studies, including Rethink, including the studies we are designing, HRCT becomes an important a sort of cog in the wheel, multiple cogs, but one cog in the wheel for diagnosing. Yes, Dr. Chabra, one quick comment about CT. Yeah, quickly, because uh, uh, we have been using CT quite a lot for the last two decades, ever since it's become easily available. The reason is that in Indian circumstances, there are two diseases which we pick up very commonly. One is bronchiectasis associated and second is previous uh, involvement of tuberculosis. Occasional patient of ABP also. And then, uh, so that adds comorbidities which would you know, explain some of the symptoms. So the goals and management principles change once bronchiectasis is there or previous tuberculosis is there. Secondly, it helps in designing your pulmonary rehabilitation program also yeah. because if there's wide spread emphysema, then your rehab methods are a little different yeah. from those who do not have emphasis. Yeah. Plus all that, what uh, the goal has said about selection of patients for surgery, that, yeah. that is uh, yeah. being known by yeah. so I love the rehab point. Good. I love and the uh, rehab point, Dr. Chabra. Krishna Bhai, you had a comment. Uh, uh, initially, I would like to uh, start telling like, Raja invited me to come here and how can I refuse my dear friend? So Thank I had to you. come and... Uh, uh, we started uh, this webinar with pre-webinar registration of 204 logins. And uh, now we have 1038 logins. So it's after a long time, like uh, uh, we did a lot of struggle in this. Somewhere our logins were coming down to 700 and all. Later we got it raised to 800, 900 and here we are at 1038 logins. So uh, this is something I'm very happy and having such a great panel here, like uh, the greatest moderator ever, Raja and uh, Chabra sir, Murali sir. And uh, Dr. Sanjeev, I think uh, he's there in the window here. Namaste, welcome. Warm regards from CCI. Agam bhai, my dear friend, my dear friend Rajesh, Atri, Mere Chote bhai. You are doing fantastically great. I have a question for you. Can you just write it down now? Uh, so that I will ask you how to, how would, how would you pronounce it? N-C-A-O-N. N-C-A-O-N. Otherwise, you can memorize and can tell me. Do not think that I am a tongue-twisting napcon here because N-C-A-O-N doesn't have P there. 
So this is not related to NAPCON. N C A O N doesn't have a P there. How would you pronounce this? A three. N Kavan. Fantastic. N Kavan. Well done. Well done. Well done. I hope everyone agrees with me here. N Kavan. Raja Bhai. Fine. So yeah. this yeah. this will be uh, during the next guidelines. This will be the preliminary stage of COPD, prior pre COPD and prism. And let me elaborate this now. No COPD as of now. <laughs> Which we so hope is all of us today. Stage, as of now, <laughs> that you should remember. No COPD as of now. So Which we COPD? hope is all of us today, isn't it? I mean, yes, yes, that's yes, probably yes, hopefully yes, all yes, of us yes, today. Yes, yeah. Yes. No, thanks. That's that's so, humor that is, for you. Uh, Thank you very much. Just for the I humor. was thinking of uh, that, that uh, you know Thailand Bangkok pronunciation. Savatika and something like that, you will come out with it. it been, <laughs> from you came out, you came back on COPD. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, the reason I entered here is we have a lot of, we preserve always a lot of respect towards gold guidelines. And gold guidelines are applicable to the entire globe, even to India. Only the tailoring of these guidelines to the Indian population and particularly to the sector of the primary and secondary care physicians. Actually, even the tertiary and the pulmonologist was required as per the requirement of Indian scenario. And that is the only reason that we are conducting this webinar. Otherwise, gold guidelines are completely acceptable, completely accepted. We appreciate them. This is not something uh, to talk against the gold guidelines. We are here to tell that how we should adopt those gold guidelines in Indian scenario. And all of you over here have done wonderfully good. And thank you so much on behalf of CCA to each and every one of you here. The reason I arrived here is only to tell this, uh, what you tell, a sentence from my side, that gold guidelines are definitely accepted, definitely they are appreciated, but only the tailoring was required here, which you people are doing brilliantly. Thank you so much, everyone. Please thank continue you, with the Bhai. webinar. Thank you and stay back. We'll want a comment from you at the very end. So stay back and we've got about 10 minutes of my questions now before we take the audience question. So can I have, I have got a difficult part, a slightly controversial part coming up, but I want crisp, short answers. I'll start off with probably the most uh, maybe debated part of uh, the gold guidance all the way through, which is about the ABE classification of gold. And uh, I'll take a couple of comments. I'll take one from... Um, Dr. Chabra first and then go to Burli and then if anyone else wants to add anything. So what people have done, like I said in my short presentation, is to replace C and D with E. The rationale in the guidance, what they have said, quote unquote gold, is that if you correlate with C and D, it almost implies that the burden of symptoms are being correlated with exacerbations and taking out C and D. And there's a very small segment of C anyway throughout the globe, especially in India establishes the fact that irrespective of the burden of symptoms, you have an exacerbating phenotype of COPD, which would merit treatment, which is slightly different to the stable symptom burden COPD population. So that's this burden. So I'll come to Dr. Chabra first. My question to you, Dr. Chabra, do you think this is useful? Do you think anything has changed? And would anything change for you in selecting the exacerbating population and then managing them in the future? Yeah, I have been uh, always very fond of ABCD classification and I wish our pulmonologists would also use this, but unfortunately, even pulmonologists are not using this very uh, widely. See, this is a great uh, uh, classification because it shifts the management principles from spirometry to symptom and exacerbations. So that is a change that came in 2011. Uh, I had a paper in 2014 which showed that C is just 3 to 4 percent. So C was not serving any purpose. So amalgamation with D was required. So that is what they have done. Yeah. Now, they could have made it ABD also, but rather than create confusion yeah. that this is old D, so they have re-christened as E. Yeah. So AB is, E is perfectly fine and it puts the things in proper perspective that exacerbators require a different kind of approach. And that is where, you know, the steroids also come in. So it's a very important step that it clearly puts the focus where steroids have to be used, where they don't have to be used. And it's not a difficult 
classmate at all. I have heard all minorities say it's so, so difficult to apply who will calculate CAT score. You don't have to calculate CAT score. Just one question to show that patient has MRC grade 2. That will pay, pay, yeah. place the patient in B. Exacerbations, that is E. So that's so simple. Yeah. So I love the, yeah, I absolutely love the way you put that, Dr. Chabra, but I'll come to Murli again. Murli, anything to add to what Dr. Chabra said about the ABE classification? You're on mute, Murli. I, I completely agree with what Professor Chabra said, and I'd like to reiterate something that Nitin Abhyankar put out on the group. He said A, asymptomatic, B, breathless, and E, exacerbator, which nicely encapsulated. It. It's not difficult to remember at all. So I think that that to me is, is the only comment I'd like to make, apart from one more point. You know, Professor Chabra said that only 3 to 4% of patients with uh, belong to group C, and I completely agree with that. But if you look at the asymptomatic population, so we did a study of about 500 patients who had uh, uh, coronary artery disease, who had never been diagnosed to have COPD. And in this group, if you look at them, we found roughly 25% in each group. These are patients who are asymptomatic, never been diagnosed to have COPD. So if you look in the asymptomatic population, you'll actually find quite a few with the group C. And that brings into question, do we really need a group C or not? I don't think so. I think this is a great move having an ABE, but you know, that's food for thought. See, yeah. those who are incidentally diagnosed to have COPD, like in CAD population, yeah. they wouldn't have had exacerbations, no? So that would be exactly a. That would be right. A, not C. So why would they be asymptomatic patient when you that, say they are in C category? They would be C. It will be A. Then. Ah, no, no. They, a, no? They, they, sorry. No, they have had exacerbations and passed off as something else. I keep getting uh -huh. cough. Oh. You know, sir, that, it's surprising that, you know, COPD is missed so much when you actually look for it. Yeah. And that's yeah. the point I wanted to make. According to me, what sir said in agreement, then actually C was mainly asthma COPD overlap kind or C was actually, it was it was giving you flexibility to add asthma COPD there, which was not actually COPD patients in my opinion. So I think this E makes it very easy. It is more sophistication yeah. and we never practiced uh, uh, C actually. We did not have much C patients who were actually COPD patients. I think it is making it simpler. True. So I'm so pleased we've got agreement on the panel on this one question. I want to come to the next question on which I also want agreement for the audience, which is how do you treat people with first stable COPD? I'll come to exacerbating later. So please stick to stable COPD, the A and B category. So what's changed in the guidance now is that uh, goal says that if you have a higher burden of symptoms, especially a cat of more than 10, you would start off with dual bronchodilator rather than starting off with a single bronchodilator, which was the case before. And the single bronchodilator we know from the POET study and other studies is a LAMA. So is it LAMA first, followed by LAMA plus LABA, or is it a LAMA LABA straight away in people who have a higher burden of symptoms in A and B category, not in E? So if we can start off with a comment first, let's, um, can I ask maybe uh, Sanjeev first? Uh, Sanjeev, uh, a comment from you, your thoughts. I mean, I'll add something. So we had the national COPD guidelines at PGI a few days ago. And while I was not a part of it, I'm privy to a lot of um, controversy that happened there. And uh, the fact that in the Indian guidance, we're actually going to put in a, a LAMA first, followed by a LAMA LABA, irrespective when you're starting treatment in treatment, naive patients, even with a higher symptom burden. So I put that Rather in the background. One, 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 one quick comment, please. Yeah. Yes, because Krishna, I want every pharma company to help us here. Uh, see, I would like to tell you that plain lava is not at all available nowadays anywhere. Earlier, Sipla used to come out with Foratec yeah. and Serovit. Now it is not at all available. Yeah. The problem here, uh, we, what we are facing is we are unable to give plain lava to any of them. It is neither available in MDR or DPA. Yeah. First problem. Second problem, if at all a known asthmatic patient becomes uh, tubercular, then we to we are unable to continue the inhalers for them because they do have a steroids with them. Sure. So your option is you have to write a combination of LABA and ICS or LABA and LAMA is available where you have to avoid ICS. This is a very 
risky thing that why would i write it to an asthma patient uh, a combination of laba and lama when yeah. laba plain is not at all available in the market even being in the guidelines what is the use of it yeah so krishna bhai fair points i'll come to sanjeev i'll quickly sort of answer your questions i think the reason the world over we don't have a laba anymore as a single drug is because there seems to be quite a lot of evidence about a lama monotherapy as opposed to laba monotherapy i think that's the reason and you know with tiotropium and glycopyronium we have pure lamas available as a single inhaler in large quantities in this country the second question which is even more interesting very relevant about laba ics so inhaled corticosteroid in an asthmatic who has developed tb for some reason i think you cannot treat an asthmatic without inhaled corticosteroid i think that's something that we need to remember so you would treat the tb as such you would maybe come down on the dose of ics depending on the control of asthma but it would probably not be prudent to shift from an ics bronchodilator combination to a pure bronchodilator combination be it single or dual if you have asthma as an established background disease so those were sort of two points sanjeev i was coming to you with the approach for gold and um, i wondered lama alone versus lama plus lama what would you do in the context of the current guidelines yeah i think you brought out the indian copd guidelines i was part of that discussion too so <laughs> i have been through that and in fact in fact uh, when we did a critical uh, you know appraisal of the gold uh, report in our department this is what i was telling my pg students that let us wait for the indian guidelines also to come and let this be sorted out so i am kind of biased on this because i have written a guideline for copd for kerala called shwas which is implemented in 500 primary health centers in uh, you know in kerala and i have written a lama alone in that as one of the options now if i go with the current gold report it uh, if i totally agree with it then it implies that you know i had to change the entire thing which i written for kerala and you know i had to change all the lama to lama lama so i i i would personally say that uh, there is a role for lama alone why should i rush directly to a lama lama when there are a you know significant proportion of patients for us it's difficult because the you know the specialist sitting here we say see the extreme uh, the most symptomatic end of patients whom probably from the very beginning we might consider starting them on a lava lava but there are copd patients out there in the field ama with the general practitioners with the primary health centers where the symptoms are not so severe enough i mean you know uh, but but mmrc if you take that just as with mmrc definitely they are into group b we don't have a d now so they yeah. are into b but definitely they do respond to a lama so there is a role to try out a lama sure. alone before jumping to a lava lama so that is where i was discussing with my students in terms of uh, you know what is it in this current gold line gold uh, you know report where i my my practice will go into contradiction with uh, what is there in the document and i feel this is one area probably where yeah. i might consider a monotherapy before jumping on to a yeah. well therapy i feel there is still a role for that and uh, yeah. the simplification i mean the abe i totally agree with uh, what uh, all of you said but now it has become too simple you know there was a time when as a examiner if i asked a student how do you manage copd and often the answer would come that i would start a lava lama i would be shocked you know i mean is this the way you answer you say there is a yeah. pharmacological management there is a non pharmacological management and even in the pharmacological management there are so so many options but today if i look at the gold report there is a abe in the table and if i look at the management options there are only two management options there actually one in a which says any proper dilator which could still be a lava lama b says it's lava lama e says it's lava lama so if a candidate actually answers lava lama he is not wide off the mark so you know yeah. Yeah, Sanjeev. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, Doctor Chabra, I completely agree with you. We need to go faster. So, I'll, I'll putly, I, I'll do something. I'll come to you at three, but I'll do something which I normally don't do, which is to put my bias in, um, uh, as a moderator. Um, so I have to say I'm biased on this question. So, uh, I had a big argument with Ritesh the other day when because I couldn't come to the guideline. We were discussing what they had said, and my bias would be that in people with a large symptom burden a cat more than 10 or whatever score that you wanted to put to people i would actually give a dual bronchodilator rather than giving a single one i would definitely start off with a lama alone in patients who have a lower symptom burden 
but in people who have a larger symptom burden who have an abnormal spirometry which is sort of moderate copd by spirometric criteria maybe i would put in i'll start off with a laba lama that's not to contradict you and confuse the audience um i'll come to you atri as to what you have to say and then maybe a quick comment from murli and i can see agam nodding his head so we'll go around a little bit and then come to the next question that i have so atri first where is the uh, king dr murli laba raja bhai you tell me please where Sorry? is the in laba available in the market single laba no single laba no single laba uh, uh, krishna bhai then why are we talking about uh, apply, apply, applying using single laba to a patient no, we are not saying not laba i am coming, not saying, coming there we are not saying lama laba ba, krishna bhai we are saying lama l a m a we are not talking about lab, lab. a laba is never available right a lama laba is never available and never used alone anymore there is practically no indication for yeah, isolated yeah. laba now yeah okay. coping dr murali sir i would want to disagree to agree with gold a if i am a patient it's always easier and safer for me to step down than to step up so there is a genuine chance as a doctor ignoring the symptom burden if i prescribe a single bronchodilator the patient can take lama from my single lava or single lama rather i would want to safely stick to a dual bronchodilator where there is symptom where i have confirmed a diagnosis of copd after 6 months stable copd gold actually mentions you can think of tapering treatment then maybe i may reduce the dual bronchodilator to a single yeah so atri i have to in a way disagree with you a little i understand the concept but the de escalation of treatment that gold talk talks about till now is stepping down on the dose of the inhaled corticosteroid you know there's good data to document yeah. that but not on the yeah. bronchodilator end yet not it might happen in the future but not on the bronchodilator mulli yeah so you know i'm the ultimate conciliator i'm always very diplomatic so i'm, I'm going to say all of you are right you know as dr sanjeev nair pointed out the group you spoke about you'd like to start with the lama alone is the less symptomatic which is basically group a where you say any bronchodilator then you mo- move on to group b which is what you defined as being more symptom higher symptom burden you're going to use a dual bronchodilator so i don't think there is any contradiction between these uh, different approaches again you know a slight disagreement with what dr atri said you want to t- definitely tackle the symptom burden but remember that every additional drug you use carries an additional risk it may be a risk of simple symptoms like tachycardia palpitations cramps and so on which you'll get with the laba so you've got to balance that against you know the benefit that it may give you in terms of symptom relief so i see no harm when you speak to the patient properly and tell them look i am going to start you on a single inhaler because i think this is better fewer medicines rather than more which would you prefer and if you don't don't improve i will bring you back and add on a second drug so i think that's perfectly fine as long as you spend a little time talking to the patient sure agam <clears throat> so oh, morli bhai i would slightly disagree on that see you put patients on dual therapy if patient you're patient... not getting your non controversial agreement between everybody <laughs> <laughs> no no what i'm trying to tell you is if you put patients on therapy even if he needs it and suppose if you develop side effects as complications you're going to stop the treatment in any case right you're going to de escalate you're going to change over whatever but in this situation when patient is symptomatic i would definitely be tempted to put him on dual bronchodilator no second thought about it and when patient is symptomatic rather has clearly said that he's symptomatic his symptom score is 10 plus no second thought about giving them trial of single uh, aerosol i mean single bronchodilator and then stepping it is wiser always to put them on dual yeah. i understand your a group Where yeah. there are, you know, yeah. less exacerbation, less symptoms. You have a choice of putting whatever in now. Since Lama is not available, you are forced to put them only on Lama. And evidence also goes more in favor of Lama. But when it comes to Group B, I think I would definitely initiate them on combination therapy. Which yeah. is exactly what I said, Agam. Yeah. A yeah. single bronchodilator. B no question about a yeah. dual bronchodilator. Yeah. And that is so the cat tail. Just, just yeah. one quick comment. I yes, think we are all saying the same thing. It's the clinical clinician who is the judge, and it's not that it's a prescription that's going to be forever. the gold also provides you that this is the only the initial statement uh, treatment after two weeks you add the second one if required 
yeah. the patient not respond it's there in the guidelines yeah yeah so i think we all agree i think the challenge was that we spoke about gold b and if the patient was treatment naive whether to start with a single or a dual and that was the controversy in the indian uh, guidance also and i think i probably feel that i would do what agam just said or murli just said and maybe even sanjeev would agree large symptom burden significantly impaired spirometry i probably would start a treatment naive patient on a dual rather than a single uh, okay. I, that's my message absolutely yeah so so let very me... briefly can i say sanjeev the uh, gold has made dramatic changes you can make changes in trust too without feeling <laughs> bad about it <laughs> so so let me uh, let me come to rajesh rajesh um i got two categories of patients and maybe if we take both because we are running out of time now um the first is about your patients in gold d now the question that's being asked in gold d is you've got a population of patients who are exacerbating and then there is the question of eosinophil count and gold has made it easy but in my understanding probably a bit too much of reliance on the eosinophil count in the gold guidance so you have a population of patients who have a, a, a eosinophil count of less than 100 you do a laba lama for gold d you have a, a a count of more than 300 exacerbating population gold e copd so i shouldn't have said gold d i should have said gold e so gold e copd you would do an ics plus a laba plus a laba now do you think that's too simplistic and too much of reliance on your sinophils or is that what you do in your population of patients and how do you actually do the 100 to 300 which is in the middle which is up to the clinician Yeah, so I think these counts of eosinophil has been exported from the study from abroad. In fact, so we don't know that how much is the eosinophil count in India, and I think we are doing study on that. And if I could just basically explain so, on that, so no, so Rajesh, no different. So we are just writing the paper, so I can give you an unofficial number. Uh, the number for eosinophil counts in six and a half thousand patients throughout India, twenty different centers, and this is just for everyone to know. Yeah. the mean so count think, in patients with asthma is 324 the mean count in patients with copd is 180 and the mean count in patients with normal individuals no airways disease is about 250 so those are ballpark numbers but that's about what it is not very different to the western population okay good that's a nice information because what i was hearing that eosinophil counts of indians are a bit higher because of exposure to air pollution and exposure to also what called parasitic infection But then, if it is so, basically, and if these are, if these patients are exacerbators, then I would I would use triple combination. In fact, and and that too, you know, also prefer what you call just in only I think only in just one inhaler, so that it also causes adherence. Uh, I won't wait actually for the patient to exacerbate, but it may happen that uh, this ICS, if we use actually before exacerbation, and if we use on on also counts of hundred hundred to three hundred. whether this would lead to actually what we call infection pneumonia and oral and oral problems and uh, all those things that happens with use of ics so so i think irrespective of whether eosinophil counts are higher or uh, higher not basically i would use it exacerbators this uh, triple combination and that to ingest uh, what they call okay this, so uh, irrespective you would use a triple animal. combination um yeah. maybe a quick comment from uh, murli murli yeah, your take you agree completely with rajesh any different in the population of patients with a eosinophil count of less than 100 or would you just go along with the triple uh you know again it's always a risk benefit ratio if i see that a risk in using steroids i would definitely not go with a triple combination and i think gold has brought it out well people who've had recurrent pneumonias people who've had a previous history of tb you know those are groups i would be very cautious about using it if they are exacerbating on the other hand i may cautiously try it if they don't have any of these problems you know so i think i would yeah. largely agree with what uh, dr yeah. rajesh said yeah grand and rajesh the other question and maybe a short answer do you feel that there's any place for the laba ics in the copd guideline just now gold seems to feel is a very small place but in your practice and the way you would change it going forward based on gold if at all do you think there's a place for the laba ics anymore so i think are it be using ics laba till now for the management of copd and its use uh, was actually for biomass fuel exposure copd as you have said 
that these are eosinophilic, uh, I mean, type. So actually, we were using lava ICS, in fact, in those, in those, of course, patients. So yeah. that's my take, basically. I, yeah. I would use, I would use lava ICS in those, in those actually patients because actually we know this fact. Sure. So quick comments. We are actually running out of time very quickly. So I'll first come to Atri. I saw his hand first, then to Murli and then to Dr. Chabra. And uh, we'll finish off after. When gold has brought absolute eosinophil count, in the near future, gold will bring CNO in COPD for possible LABA ICS combination. Yeah. But do you think you would be identifying the ACO population rather than Exactly. The COPD population. Not the high risk under. population, but the ACO population. Yeah, sure. Sure. Murli. Uh I'm 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 gonna request Dr. Krishna to talk to the companies and start a trial on an ICS Lama combination, which seems to be the way to go rather than yeah. ICS Lama. So Krishna ji, that is your next task. That's a brilliant comment. Sure, Thanks, sir. Murli. Sure, I think sir. that's sure, sure, yeah, sure, sure. Dr. Chabra. See, uh, uh, it's good that we have uh, used the term ACO. Now, this term uh, is probably being given up already. The S was removed some time back, then ACO has also been discarded. Asthma, if it is there, definitely steroids are in. You know, so that is the point that I think everybody is trying to make. If there is just a few steroids, then it has to be given. Yeah. As far as COPD is concerned, it's excessive. Eosinophils as such, are such a labile cell that yeah. today you have one figure, next week yeah. you have some other figure. Yeah. So that is not a reliable figure. It's the history. If there's anything to suggest atopy or an asthma kind of, and uh, etotypes also, now it labels it as COPD and asthma. So the term ACOS is no longer used in uh, literature fr from this point forward. So sure. if there's atopy, suggestion of uh, allergic alanitis, mm -hmm. Asthmatic symptoms, definitely lava ICS would be in. Yeah. More to treat asthma than to treat COPD. Yeah. COPD, it's exacerbation which are probably the most important factor while picking up the steroids and usually as a part of triple therapy. Sure. Sure. Agreed. So can I have one line answers with tail end last five minutes? I'll come first to Atri. Uh, Atri, this question has to go to you. It's about interventions. So Broadly speaking, we'll not go into individual interventions, but be it the denervation therapy for chronic bronchitis, be it the coils or the vapor for COPD. Do you think our time has come in India today to adopt these in a large scale? Or do you think we are still sort of behind by about five years before we can adopt these? And do you think they're relevant in an Indian population and practice, given the population, the large population base we have? Indian subset of patients are larger than any global population of COPD. Secondly, India is not lagging behind at least in intervention. Whatever may be done in Europe or North America is current or Southeast Asia is being done in India at the par at the same time. Thirdly, thanks to good definitions by gold, and wider approach of spirometry, and I am not taking the name of oscillometry, we are picking up COPD patients earlier. We are selecting patients for interventions earlier. So very soon, there has to be clear-cut demarcation that this patient, early surgery, this patient, early bronchoscopic intervention, rather than wait and watch for worsening yeah. of exacerbation. Yeah. So... You know, you are a young Turk, Atri, enthusiastic. I agree with you, but I am sort of uh, more gray hairs, uh, like a lot of others on the panel. You know, I think the enthusiasm about the interventional treatment in COPD probably will peter out like it has done for bronchial thermoplasty in case of asthma. You know, the population is probably, even with the 140 crore and the large sort of 7% COPD population, you're actually looking at a very small subset. And in our country, the cost of this therapy needs to come down, even if it's to be implemented in that small subset of patients. So we've tried to sort of do vapor and we are sort of struggling to find patients. It's, it's difficult. But I take your point. I think we probably need to watch out this space and be optimistic in going forward for this. Agam, I wanted to come to you with the exacerbation question. The definition has changed. Do you think anything has changed in your book and what was said in the definition and about approach to an exacerbation of COPD? No, I think this was a very welcome thing because the last uh, exacerbation definition was a little bizarre. 
I mean, it had very, it had couple of shortcomings. It did not give you duration. It uh, and here now it gives you uh, fourteen days uh, duration. So th this would really help in uh, uh, you know diagnosing or picking up uh, exacerbation uh, better. It still relies only on uh, uh, subjective perception of uh, this increased uh, breathlessness, but. Uh, the newer definition gives you chance to you know assess various other things so i think it is welcome change yeah yeah so welcome change i agree with that i don't think a lot of change in the way of management there's a question in the question box about magnesium sulfate in patients with copd i don't think we got evidence at all in copd be that for iv or that nebulized therapy the only little evidence we have is in asthma uh, but that's also sort of a debatable evidence so um i'll come with my last question i think we have actually answered most of the questions from the audience in the question box so my last question and i'll go around a little and i'll also come to krishna bhai at the end uh, dr chabra so we have mostly spoken about cutting edge science we have spoken about the interpretation of the gold guidelines on the basis of what we would do in the positions that we are in in tertiary care centers you very rightly said that most people who treat copd are much more from the primary and the secondary care basket so your thoughts sort of briefly about how this is implementable if at all in primary and secondary care whereas sanjeev said access to doing spirometry or the consciousness of spirometry is not there leave alone trying to identify someone with prism or early copd see uh, uh, we have to talk about copd as a public health problem individual patients where we can do surgery or endoscopic that is for individual patients as a mass problem the number of patients is so huge and the number of pulmonologists is very very small so majority of patients are managed by non pulmonologists or at primary and secondary care now the gold guidelines is a strategy so it has enough for us to extract from it and apply at different levels for example at tertiary care level practically everything is implementable the unfortunate thing is even today pulmonists are not using it so even the pulmonologists should start using the guidelines these are evidence based good for the patient at primary level at secondary level we have to promote spirometry because it remains the gold standard efforts are on the government of india has made some steps now it is provided in the list of equipments for primary health centers and district hospitals that this equipment must be there So there is some progress, but a lot of work has to be done. The drugs are widely available. We have to make sure that people start making a diagnosis. Today, people are not writing a diagnosis, whether it's asthma or COPD, just taking history and starting the treatment. So there is no distinction between asthma and COPD. So our problems are much different, but the answers are there in the guidelines and the strategy. So it's a strategy which needs to be disseminated, and people should start. treating copd as copd asthma as copd it requires education no doubt and it should start from the medical school itself from under graduation yeah i i love that answer up i think implementable but a lot to do in the way of education into trying to cascade down guidance rather than saying it's not implementable i love that uh, one line sort of messages i'll start off with that three and i'll go around So, Atri, one learning that you want to give to people from the gold guidance, which you think is particularly relevant from your perspective. Vaccines are magic bullet. Universally advise them. Learn teleconsult, tele rehab. All of you. Yeah. So one more line. That's one question I I couldn't actually ask because of lack of time. Because you've said it now, Atri. So tele rehab. Do you think it's very relevant, Atri? Do you think that's the way forward for India? that is the way forward when there has been a legal recognition it's always better to tele rehab rather than loss to follow up yeah grand i agree with you ratri i would be very very firmly in favor of tele rehab we need to get it into a trial we need to make sure that it works and i'm sure it works but we need to have evidence for that and i am completely with you in saying that it seems to work in our population of patients uh, agam one comment from you so these guidelines would create some uh, interest i think it is time where we understand these guidelines implement these guidelines 
COPD, different terminology give me option to understand this disease behavior. We were putting them in just bas one basket and, and it, it used to become difficult to understand disease behavior. It will give me options to understand them and probably phenotypes, uh, overlapping phenotypes. So I think future is going to be very interesting. I love them. Yeah, thank you. Rajesh. Yeah, so actually we've got this gold protocol strategy, but there is actually a moral imperative to improve access to effective treatment. And I would say that we should go for national program on COPD. We should advocate for that. And hence, actually, we actually we can just we can just go to rural areas and yeah. also diagnose it. So that's yeah. what I, I just feel like implementation of yeah. uh, these guidelines. Advocacy. Uh, way to go. Thanks. Uh, uh, let me come to Sanjeev next. Sanjeev. I think uh, this goal for me is basically, you know, saying that uh, COPD is not just about smoking. You have to think much beyond smoking and so many other things. It has been there in the past, but that has been emphasized a lot. I think that's a message we can take. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Sanjeev. Very important about smoking. So wonderful. Murli to you. I'd like to make two comments. One is I like to s the goal guidelines, the goal strategy, because every time we're seeing it's becoming more and more evidence-based, stronger evidence-based, and it's made it easier for us to use and disseminate, one. Two, my disappointment is, and I, I'm not sure how true this is, but I got this message from one of my you know, friends who said, the NMC has asked for 10 hours to be taught by a pulmonologist undergrad, and it does not include COPD. It's TB and asthma, and there's no mention of COPD in what is required. So I think the ICS, Dr. Rajesh, everyone else here, I think we need to take it up with the NMC and say this is the second most common cause of death in this country. We need to spend more time on it. Please put in something on it. Yeah. Dr. Murli, so Murli, just to correct you, I think it's obstructive airway disease, and there's a lot of focus on COPD in that. So it's not just asthma. I think there's a breakup of the syllabus and covers COPD as well. Yeah. It does. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I, so I I understand where you're coming from, Sanjeev, but I think as pulmonologists, we are probably a little less aggressive as compared to some other colleagues in cardiology and Absolutely. gastroenterology and neurology and so on and so forth. So I think the point for me, sort of taking forward what Murli said is that we need to be a little bit more proactive and aggressive as national societies, as individuals, as, as people of value in pushing forward respiratory disease, which combined if you look at the first three in the greatest killers, probably forms about 30% of the causes of mortality from any disease process, more than 30%. So that's a large number and we need to appreciate that. And we need to advocate our case both nationally and globally. Um, I would like to thank everyone. I'll hand over to Dr. Krishna in the very end as the real host, actually. I'm just an acting host, but uh, thank you very, very much, everyone. And to the entire CCI family, um, I consider myself as a part of the CCI family. Thank you very much for having this panel discussion. I hope we can come out with a white paper on the Indian implementation of these guidelines. And I really enjoyed doing this today. I hope all of you did listening to us. Uh, thank you from my side to Sipla for supporting us in this cause. And over to Dr. Krishna. Pleasure to have you, Dr. Krishna. The final word has to lie with you. Brilliant you so moderation, much, Raja. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raja. Sorry, thank you, Raja. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, everyone here. Uh, I have uh, I don't have much words to speak because uh, such a wonderful uh, moderator uh, like Raja and uh, such a uh, galaxy of stars here as a panelist. So as I am always known like Agam, like the way when I am going out, I'll come out again with the humor. So I was uh, uh, actually I was asking repeatedly about Laba. No one helped me out over here. And Murli sir is telling me to influence the pharma company for uh, Lama ICS study, where I couldn't fetch a Laba plane for myself. How could I influence Lama ICS study for the pharma companies? And I am always at liberty to decide what I need. If I need Laba plane, I need Laba plane. When there is Sama plane still, when there is Saba plane still, why not Laba plane still? So that is my question. And also, I would like to tell that I am practicing for the last 22 years. I have uh, done this uh, la plain laba also with few people. So it's my, I am on the one to decide ultimately. And uh, regarding the gold guidelines to go out, uh, to give a touch of humor, before that, I will uh, always quote that I have learned uh, from Dr. Murli Mohan. 
agree to agree agree to disagree disagree to agree disagree to disagree <laughs> so all that is have, is there everywhere but um, this gold guidelines uh, has given a happy message to a sector of people uh, who called me repeatedly and thanked me and they told that their words should be brought in the webinar when i am the when i go live so a sector of people have thanked a lot the new gold guidelines because scientifically they will disprove that uh, smokers are not the only people who are reasonable for copd so the smokers have thanked the gold guidelines for discovering <laughs> the non smoking copd <laughs> <laughs> okay so wonderful it was with everyone uh, thank you everyone on behalf of cci thank you thanks a lot let us have more okay. such webinar in future thank you thank you bye bye great good job day. Day. as expected good night good night thank you much bye, bye.